Churchill wanted to get the French out of both North Africa and Southeast Asia, and while the French would be easy to dislodge from North Africa, and the French were no match for the Japanese in Vietnam, the Italians in North Africa were more dangerous because they'd been there longer, having lived in Libya ever since they'd once been Rome. The British would sink the French fleet in Algeria first thing on the 3rd of July in 1940, killing 1,300 French sailors, and they bombed the Italian navy in November of 1940, and the French would scuttle what was left of their own navy to keep it out of the hands of the British a couple weeks after the Americans landed in North Africa in November of 1942. Churchill claimed that the French fleet had not been turned over to the British when Hitler marched into France in May of 1940, and adding those ships to the Royal Navy would have left Britain the supreme overlord of the Mediterranean and put them squarely in a position to cut a deal with Hitler favorable to Britain. But the Americans had now joined in the war and began interfering right away with Churchill's best-laid plans. The American Merchant Marine Act of 1936 was known primarily as the Ship Subsidy Bill, and in 1935, 90% of American ships were 20 years or older, thanks to the Great Depression. And economists warned about the evil and waste of government money mixed in with the private sector, but when the private businesses stayed too private or needed a shot in the arm, a little government money didn't hurt just so long as the government wasn't trying to profit from building ships, turning the rules of production into counterproduction. The Americans wanted to stop the government from creating huge shipyards that would build massive amounts of unneeded boats, which would put private built be boat builders out of business. So the U.S. Shipping Board was created to protect private boat builders, and only civilians could serve on the shipping board. The Royal Navy had a similar board, but the difference was that the British board was all military, and while the Royal Navy didn't make any money on building ships, their job was to safeguard the shipping lanes, and the Royal Navy needed more money from Parliament to protect British shipping because the Royal Air Force, RAF, was being heralded as the latest thing and a less expensive solution to the costly Royal Navy. Parliament had fallen in love with airplanes and was putting more money into airfields than they were willing to spend on the struggling Royal Navy, so the plan was to prove that airplanes were sitting ducks on the ground and inferior to the mobility of warships, and the Battle of Britain began as a competition between the RAF and the Royal Navy. Churchill simply wanted to prove to Parliament that airplanes were unreliable and too dangerous to take seriously, and that safe, steady, and economical shipping could only be protected by sea. Aircraft carriers were also said to be too unwieldy and vulnerable, which the Royal Navy proved by hitting the Italian fleet as it was resting peacefully in harbor six months after Hitler marched into France. What better way to discredit the airplane than entice the Germans into a little shooting war? The RAF would lose all their funny, rickety planes, and instead of building more, the Royal Navy would point to the Germans' new battleships, Bismarck and Tirpitz, as fair warning about the strength of bigger armored ships, so the Royal Navy and Admiral Canaris put on a little show for Parliament with sea exercises using live ammunition live ammunition. The Battle of Britain began on the 13th of August in 1940 and would last until late September, with poor English working-class neighborhoods full of labor agitators as the primary targets, and Hitler bombed some British airplane factories on the 23rd of August, but a dozen German planes drifted off target and hit London instead, and nine civilians died, so England retaliated by bombing Berlin four times. The British liked to bomb, Ber bomb Germany at night to save more pilots, and the Americans would bomb during the day to save more civilians, but after a while it didn't matter anymore when much of Germany would be reduced to rubble, and fires from the bombing would get so hot they could create tornadoes. The British government had not been able to tax their subjects highly enough to keep up appearances in the far-flung British territories, and the Royal Navy 
had become too expensive to keep afloat without borrowing more money from British banks already holding collateral on loans that included mortgage bonds bought up cheap during the Wall Street crash of 1929 and its sequel in 1934. And when Germans started defaulting on their mortgage payments on those bonds and real estate prices in Germany began to drop precipitously with all the empty Jewish homes flooding the market, the British bankers needed mortgage payments coming in so Hitler became their vehicle to make Germany prosperous enough that Germans could afford to pay their mortgages again. The consensus in America was that it was better for Germany to be reduced to rubble than for it to become, become a British satellite, and the French in Tunisia and the Italians in Libya were a threat to Britain who needed control of the Suez Canal to keep British ships moving from India to Europe, so the French and the Italians had to be put out of business in the Mediterranean. But the question was how to cripple France and Italy without a protest from the Americans, who would certainly come over to help their French friends, just as they had during the Great War. There was that French Statue of Liberty in America's New York Harbor. There were those Italian families running all the labor unions in America, and all those Irish and Scots and Germans in America. Obviously, America was the biggest threat to the British Empire and needed to be put in its place. So if Hitler was invited into France and Italy, then the British army counter-invading would be welcomed as liberators. British troops in France would present themselves as saviors and protectors against the evil Nazis, and France would be forced to sign the Anglo-Franco Union Treaty, and under orders of the British army, the French would no longer be able to cause trouble in the Mediterranean or threaten traffic on the Suez Canal. The plan was to show the Americans what empire was all about, and the Americans would be handed a clever and resounding defeat that would keep them away from European affairs for a long, long time. Churchill rented two floors of the Rockefeller Center in America in the spring of 1940, and he opened offices in all major American cities, while FDR sent Bill Don Bill Donovan to England to spy on the British, and especially to check up on Joe Kennedy, who was hobnobbing with the Wallace and Edward crowd. Donovan had been a colonel in the Great War, and he and FDR had gone to Columbia Law School together, and Donovan found out that the British did not like Joe Kennedy, not because Joe liked Hitler, which nobody believed, even though British intelligence produced forged documents to prove it but because Joe Kennedy didn't like the British, who didn't like Joe Kennedy because he was Irish. In December of 1940, Donovan spent over a week in Bermuda to listen to tittle-tattle and take names and soak up some sun. Joe Kennedy was a rogue patriot outside the mainstream of Washington politics, and he was a personal friend of FDR, and FDR's New Deal had included provisions to investigate the Great Crash, and Joe Kennedy had been the first chairman of the SEC that prosecuted over 300 people, but only one of them went to jail, and it was only for three years. Now, instead of investing, Americans thought that working for a living was a better idea than buying and selling stocks, and among all the other losers, Churchill had lost a fortune in the crash of 1929. Now the New Deal contracted with companies to make war work possible, and less than 20% of market gains during Hitler's war would come from private money. In 1938, the bankers held a capital strike to protest both the New Deal and Hitler's Strength Through Joy program because the market had skewed towards government employment and not enough people were taking out loans to keep the banks in business. And to make matters worse, in Germany, real estate prices were continuing to fall. The capital strike hurt Hitler's economic plan, and he had to go into Poland to get more sources of revenue when the banks stopped lending money to Germany. 
and as the British Prime Minister in 1937, Chamberlain had been in charge of building up the British military and reintroduced conscription in 1938, signing a pact with Hitler personally on the 30th of September in 1938 that gave Hitler permission to substantially enlarge the German Navy in violation of the Treaty of Versailles, which in turn gave the British Navy reason to demand increases of their own. We, the German Führer and Chancellor and the British Prime Minister, have had a further meeting today and are agreed in recognizing that the question of Anglo-German relations is of first importance for the two countries and for Europe. We regard the agreement signed last night and the Anglo-German naval agreement as symbolic of the desire of our two people never to go to war with one another again. We are resolved that the method of consultation shall be the method adopted to deal with any other questions that may concern our two countries, and we are determined to continue our efforts to remove possible sources of difference and thus to contribute to, the, to assure the peace of Europe. Signed, Adolf Hitler, Neville Chamberlain, September 30th, 1938. To Hitler, that last line meant, Your contributions to peace are effective. Keep up the good work. Your army is strong enough to keep out the Russians. To Chamberlain, that last line meant, Before you use any of those weapons you're building, please call us and together we'll fight the Russians. Chamberlain would be smeared and denigrated by the BBC and all the British newspapers when Hitler went into Norway, and the public turned against Chamberlain, but it had gone a long way towards getting more money approved for the Royal Navy, and Churchill displaced Chamberlain to become the new Prime Minister the same day that Hitler marched into France. Shipping companies in America did not want to compete with the government in the shipping business, while in England the Royal Shipping Board was in the business of keeping itself in business by creating a threat to the shipping lanes worthy of protection from the Royal Navy, especially to safeguard passage through the Suez Canal, and the British had started the Boer War to protect their passage around the Cape Horn. At the Dogger Bank in 1904, after the Boer War, the Russian Navy had to shoot up a Royal Navy commando squad disguised as a group of fishing boats that were on a mission to ambush Russian ships, and the Russians succeeded in stopping the British fishing boats from laying mines at Dogger Bank. The Boer War was also called Kishner's War, and Horatio Kishner didn't know how much food people ate because his food had always been prepared and brought in by servants, and he didn't know how much horses ate because someone else always fed the horses, and he didn't know what it was like to have one's family thrown out of their home because Kishner had never had a family of his own, but he did have a pet starling. The British took over all the Boer courts and put the Boers in concentration camps, and then Kishner's friends confiscated the camp inmates' land while 26,000 Boer families died in the camps, and the inmates were said to have gotten sick because they hadn't kept themselves clean. Kishner said that he'd been told the camps were being run in a military fashion, and he said that he never visited them, and 30,000 native South Africans also died in the Boer War, having fought on both sides, and many had signed up to fight with the British, thinking it would do them some good afterwards, but the British left them behind and told the South Africans that they should be grateful for having had the experience. Kishner was sent to India in 1911 and would become Haig's commander-in-chief for the Great War. And on the 28th of July in 1912, the Royal Navy seized two battleships being built for Turkey, even though the ships had already been paid for by the Turks, and the 500 Turkish sailors waiting to board their new battleship were detained by the British, and the next day Parliament passed the bill to modernize the Royal Navy. Turkey signed a pact with Germany on the 2nd of August, less than a week after their new ships had been seized. Holland had become prosperous building ships, and the Royal Navy had completely destroyed the Dutch fleet in 1797 because Holland had become friends with France, 
and a Dutch William of Orange had become the King of England in 1688, when he married the great pretender's half-sister, and the French had moved into Holland with Napoleon in 1795, where they were welcomed by the Dutch people, so the British had declared war on the Dutch, and had won the Cape of Good Hope away from the Dutch, setting up the Boer War, and the Kaiser of Germany had indeed meddled in Africa in support of the Boers. As soon as Chamberlain had the naval agreement paper signed in September of 1938, Britain made a pact with Poland and started the military draft in England, and then tried to negotiate a deal with Russia that wasn't such a good deal for Russia, and Stalin made his non-aggression pact with Hitler on the 20th of August in 1939. Poland had been promised military assistance from Britain, but that wouldn't work out so well for them, and Britain declared war on Germany over the Polish deal that was based on the naval agreement, giving Germany the port of Danzig back so Germany could upgrade their new expanded naval fleet. Hitler had signed a ten-year non-aggression pact with Poland in 1934 because British newspapers had been running stories about Hitler's maniacal aggression towards Poland, and the pact between Hitler and Stalin was that Germany would deliver guns and machinery to Russia over the next two years so the Russians could keep out the British, and for their part, Russia would send Germany raw materials. The night Hitler signed the pact with Stalin, the northern lights appeared in full cosmic display as far south as Berchtesgaden, and Hitler knew that God was on his side. <laughs>